Your Honours, ladies and gentlemen, and those in Townsville, uh, each of this year's Selden Society lectures has been a treat. There are two consistent ingredients, I think. The first has been a great subject, and the second, a terrific presentation. Tonight, we'll have both those ingredients again. The subject is Tom Bingham, later Lord Bingham, and the presenter who I had the honour to introduce is Justice James Edelman. A week ago, His Honour gave an equity lecture in this room when he deconstructed and reassembled the law of tracing. He's industrious to a fault in returning so soon. Bearing that in mind, and with your indulgence, may I not list all His Honour's credentials. Instead, may I say how glad we are to have him here in Queensland. Um, a well-known Australian sportsman, the cricketer Mitchell Johnson, recently retired. He, of course, is a Queenslander who was stolen by Western Australia. With the assistance of the Federal Court of Australia, we in Queensland are glad to have stolen Justice Edelman <laughs> from Western Australia as a repayment of that interstate debt, with interest, I think. On a slightly more serious note, may I focus on one aspect of His Honour's achievements thus far, and that is His Honour's reputation so well deserved as an outstanding teacher at the University of Oxford. That university was the first in England to offer a degree in law. His Honour obtained a DPhil in law from Magdalen College in 2001, and at a very young age was appointed to a university chair as the Professor of the Law of Obligations in 2008, a befitting recognition of one of the university's leading research and teaching academics. This, we remember, occurred at the university where William Holdsworth, Rupert Cross and Peter Burks taught with such distinction. We're privileged to have those skills deployed in our favour tonight. And would you please, with me, welcome Justice Edelman. Justice Jackson, thank you very much. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It was a frosty morning in England, in Oxford, in the Hillary term in 2009. About 40 students had gathered outside the law boardroom. They were waiting for the librarian to open the doors to usher them into the seminar for the BCL course on human rights. One of the group was a little older than the others. One of the Australian graduate students, who as a group uh, tend not to be lacking in confidence, turned to the older man and introduced himself. The older man uh, shook the Australian's hand and said, I'm Tom. And what are you studying, Tom? said the Australian graduate. The former student who told me this story said that the Australian student was saved from embarrassment, at least until the seminar began, because the doors opened and the crowds began to file in before he could hear the um, reply from Tom. Tom, or Thomas Bingham, or Lord Bingham of Cornhill, was described in Professor Sands's obituary as the greatest English judge since World War II. He was the first modern judge to hold all of the positions of Master of the Rolls, Lord Chief Justice, and Senior Law Lord. And he embodied many of the virtues of a truly great judge. It's fitting, I think, that we should finish this lecture series with Lord Bingham but not for chronological reasons. Nor is the reason why it's fitting to conclude with Lord Bingham because of the legacy that he'll leave in the law reports. Indeed, I suspect that in 100 years' time, it's very unlikely that scholars of the law will recall the name Bingham alongside the names of Cook, Mansfield, Eldon, Blackburn, Atkin or Denning. Bingham himself never thought of himself as a judge who would leave such a legacy. At the height of his powers, giving the Chatham Lecture on the Future of the Common Law to a packed audience, Bingham remarked that his speech reminded him of P.G. Woodhouse's reference in his book Summer Lightning uh, to the preface. Woodhouse had observed there that there was already another book entitled Summer Lightning, but he wrote he had high hopes that his book would one day be included in the list of 100 best books called Summer Lightning. The real reason why it's fitting to conclude this series with a speech about Lord Bingham is because he left a legacy of what it means, I think, to combine the elements of what should make the ideal judge. 
His style, his demeanour, his work ethic, his caution, his brilliance, his patience, his courtesy, his humility, and the respect he afforded to his colleagues. Very rarely is a judge encountered who combines all of these qualities. Thomas Bingham was born in London on the 13th of October 1933. His father was Thomas Henry Bingham. His paternal grandfather was Thomas Henry Bingham. This might have placed his parents in something of a conundrum when their firstborn child was a girl. But perhaps fortunately for their daughter, they chose to wait to bestow the family names upon their second child. There was a moment of possible rebellion when Bingham's mother suggested that O'Neill should be included in the name. Bingham's grandfather, uh, Thomas Henry Bingham, sent a telegram to his son and daughter-in-law. It had only two words, omit O'Neill. In the brief time that I have allotted this evening, I'll skip over some of the detail of Bingham's early years at school. Suffice to say that his Wikipedia entry is entirely inaccurate. Um, that entry describes him as having been considered as the brightest boy in 100 years at his school. In fact, it took several years before Bingham's academic acumen was recognised. He won various literature awards, but his main contribution was to the extracurricular life of the school the debating society, the school magazine, uh, the library, and as a prefect. He initially flirted after school with the idea of ordination, but eventually decided to apply to read history at Balliol. He applied in 1951 to Balliol to read history. Balliol was his first choice for very odd reasons. Um, his housemaster, who was a particularly unpleasant man, had said to Bingham, well, B -b Bingham of B -b -b Balliol, I think it must be. So it was on the whim of this alliteration that Bingham sought entry to Balliol and Oxford. He provided the following account of his interview at Balliol. I applied for a scholarship. My first impression was awe. It seemed like a holy city. I vividly recall being interviewed by Christopher Hill. I had a passion for Cromwell, and to this day, I kick myself when I was asked who Cromwell most resembled in modern days. I froze. The answer, of course, was Lenin. Bingham got a scholarship, but it wasn't a very good one. He wanted to obtain a better scholarship, so he re remained at school for a further year. But his December 1951 attempt at a higher scholarship was unsuccessful. He didn't go straight to Oxford. Uh, following World War II, he spent the first two years in national service. During his interview with a recruiting sergeant, Bingham was asked if he was a good scholar. He was still recovering from only having received a minor scholarship at Oxford, and so he replied, well, not really. To which the sergeant responded, well, can you read and write at all? <laughs> um, after flirting with the possibility of a career in the army, he then commenced at Balliol in Michaelmas in 1954 to read for a PPE, uh, Politics, Philosophy and Economics. A.B. Roger, the economic historian, had written to J.B. Corbett, the PPE tutor in 1952, and said, I think he has quite the wits to get a respectable second in the PPE. Bingham soon switched to history, where he graduated with a very respectable first. He won the Gibbs Prize for Modern History by examination early in his final year. Following his results, the master of Balliol, Sir David Kerr, wrote to Bingham, I am very glad you got your first. A year ago I would have been very doubtful, but you made enormous strides in your last year and you richly deserve it. Here in Balliol we are very much in your debt both by doing so well in scholarship, but also by taking the part that you did in its general life. If all the undergraduates would put as much, place, um, but mu as much into the place as you did, the sky would be the limit. As with his school life, Bingham was enthusiastically involved in many aspects of extracurricular university life. Um, John Keegan, the military historian and friend of uh, Bingham's, said that it was always clear to us that he was going to do great things. He was a very funny speaker. Balliol was full of debating societies and Tom belonged to all of them. In one university long vacation, Bingham decided to climb Mount Blanc. He decided to set a very good time. He completed it in possibly, what was possibly one of the fastest times then achieved by an amateur. His, a glimpse, in a glimpse into his extraordinary drive, he recounted the following of his climb. I'm not a colossally serious climber, but I've always loved the mountains, and one can become rather competitive. I remember when climbing Mount Blanc that we discovered some climbers who'd been lying in a crevasse for several days. We, decided, we had to decide whether to help them or to go to the top and reach them on the way down. We did the latter. 
I suppose I can be rather ruthless at times. Bingham briefly contemplated an academic career after Oxford. He applied for the All Souls College Prize Fellowship, but missed out. So after having contemplated initially ordination, then contemplating a career in the army, then contemplating an academic career, he eventually went to the bar. He's another one of those brilliant English lawyers who, like Jonathan Sumption, stand in the path of acceptance in England that a lawyer ought to have a law degree. Bingham read for the bar as an Eldon Law Scholar. He passed as top of his bar exams and was called to Gray's Inn in 1959, um, having been admitted um, already to the inn in 1956. He won the Gray's Inn Society's prize for a first class pass in the bar finals. He won the Arden Scholarship and a Stuart Cunningham um, Maskich KC Scholarship. He then began his pupillage under Owen Stable in January 1959 and he eventually accepted a tenancy at Fountain Court. At the time, the head of the Fountain Court um, was Lord Scarman, and uh, I'll come later to the, some of the parallels between Lord Bingham and Lord Scarman. The Oxford Dictionary of National Biography describes Bingham's early days as a knockabout succession of poorly paid briefs in undefended divorces, magistrates, courts, defences, and the like. Bingham himself described his early days as in the following terms. At the bottom of chambers in those days, we were completely unspecialised. We would do really virtually anything. A lot of it was extremely menial and a lot of it was extremely ill-paid. So that one would rush around the magistrates' courts and if they were in central London, defend drivers who were accused of, of careless driving. But if it was a little bit further out, you were paid a bit more and you conducted a jury trial at the London Sessions or at the Old Bailey. This work was not greatly sought after with the result that there was a certain amount of it which we were all very pleased to do. However, it did not take long for Bingham to attract some serious work in public and commercial law. By 1968, he became the junior standing counsel for the Ministry of Labor. He occupied that position for four years. He was also standing counsel of the Bank of England. He soon came to the attention of Lord Denning, who was then the master of the roles. Melford Stevenson, who was the previous head of chambers at Fountains Court, had put a strong word in also with the Lord Chief Justice, Lord Widgery. The result of this attention was that in 1972, um, at the age of 38, Bingham took silk. He was the most junior of barristers to be appointed silk that year, and one of the most junior of silks. However, despite his relative youth, he developed an extensive practice rapidly and became a, report, a recorder in 1975. Within only those first few years of taking silk, Bingham rose to become a leader of the English bar. Lord Denning identified Bingham and Patrick Neal as the two foremost advocates of their time. Lord Phillips also described Bingham as one of the three outstanding advocates of their generation. Lord Phillips described the other two as being Robert McCrindle and Lord Alexander. He gives the following dis contrasting description of the styles of the three. Bob McCrindle, silver-tongued, gave the impression that his only concern was to prevent the court from making a terrible mistake. Bob Alexander always appeared personally to be persuaded of the merits of his client's case and not prepared to leave a point until he had talked the court into sharing his viewpoint. But Tom's approach was to present a series of propositions, each one honed with precision and supported by authority. The effect of each item would be summarised in a pellucid precy. This advocacy, firmly delivered but with tactful deference, was devastatingly effective. As Stephen Sedley explained, there was nothing flamboyant or, or, or oratorical about Bingham's style of advocacy. He was quietly spoken, courteous, and extremely methodical. In 1977, having been silk for five years, he was also appointed the head of an inquiry into allegations of breaches of United Tra Nations trade sanctions against Rhodesia. The Rhodesian inquiry caused a sensation. Bingham found that oil companies had knowingly contravened the sanctions and alarmingly with the complicity of British public servants. Although no prosecutions followed from his findings, his work was widely lauded. Um, in 1979, he was made a bencher of Gray's Inn and two of the other three inns, inns of court also made him an honorary, honorary bencher. In 1979, the earnings of leading barristers at the English bar were very significant. Today, they're astronomical. But Bingham was not materialistic in any sense. While other barristers had vast estates in the countryside or in the south of France, Bingham had a simple cottage in Wales. 
His son and, uh, son-in-law and parliamentarian, Jesse Norman, described the cottage as a typical Welsh farmer's cottage and simply appointed. The phrase simply appointed is a lovely English euphemism. The, college, the, the cottage had no hot water. It had no cold water. In fact, it had no internal plumbing. It had no sanitation. A council inspection had concluded that the house was unfit for human habitation. <laughs> In the year when Bingham was appointed Lord Chief Justice and elevated to the House of Lords, he took on the title of Cornhill after the Welsh hamlet where his cottage was located. It was only then that he decided to renovate the cottage to include running water and sanitation. Bingham's generosity and his lack of concern for material wealth were also shown in Chambers. He focused very heavily on the pupils in Chambers. He would involve them in discussion of legal problems, take them to after work drinks with other members of Chambers, and in an era where pupils were paid a, paid a fee for the privilege of working in chambers, in at least one instance, Bingham connived a way to return a pupil's 100 guinea pupilage fee by paying the pupil 10 pounds a week for his assistance. He behaved in the same way to his juniors. Lord Phillips tells the story of um, when he acted as Bingham's junior in a competition case. Phillips had just moved from an admiralty chambers and he described himself as having no feel for either the law or the procedure in competition law. In a conference with solicitors and clients, Bingham turned to his junior and said, right, well, we'll need the usual summons and the affidavit in support. Phillips's face fell. Bingham said nothing. Only when the <coughs> solicitors had left did he turn to Phillips and quietly say, don't worry, I'll draft all the documents. In 1980, at the age of 46, he became a High Court judge in the Queen's Bench Division and a judge of the Commercial Court. While several of Bingham's peers at the bar, including McCrindle and Alexander, had declined an offer to join the bench, Bingham took the opportunity. Later, when discussing his reasons for accepting appointment, Bingham described that practice in silk sometimes left advocates feeling like heavyweight boxers who just can't bear to go back into the ring. He explained that as you get more senior, cases get longer, which makes them more burdensome and, in a sense, more worrying, particularly if they can go wrong. Bingham never regretted taking an appointment at the young age. In one of the final contributions he made about the Supreme Court, um, he suggested that judges ought to consider um, going to the bench at an earlier age and that the task of selecting future justices is not to choose seasoned season judges nearly, nearing the end of their distinguished careers to spend two or three years before retirement, but to choose able younger candidates who'd have time to mature and develop in office. On the Queen's bench, Sir Thomas, as he became, um, was assigned to the commercial court. Very few of his decisions were overturned. One exception was the case of Reza Shipping and Edmonds, which was controversially overturned by the House of Lords. The appeal rested on an inference that had been drawn by Justice Bingham, based on his findings of fact, that a ship had been lost at sea. Lord Brandon, who delivered the only reasoned judge judgment in the House of Lords, had enjoyed a very similar career to Lord Bingham. He'd also gone to the bench, this time in Admiralty, at the age of 46. Lord Brandon delivered a judgment which was sarcastic and, at points, almost sneering. He said this of the reasoning of Justice Bingham. My Lords, the late Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in his book The Sign of Four describes his hero, Mr Sherlock Holmes, as saying to the latter's friend, Dr Watson, how often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth? It is no doubt on the basis of this well-known but unjudicial dictum that Justice Bingham decided to accept the shipowner's submarine theory, even though he regarded it for seven cogent reasons as extremely improbable. Bingham did not take kindly to the House of Lords' critique of, this, of his reasoning. It may have been a reason why, in the entirety of his career as an appellate judge, Bingham never spoke unkindly or with sarcasm about any of the decisions of which he reviewed on appeal. In 1986, Bingham was appointed to the Court of Appeal, and in 1992, Bingham succeeded Lord Donaldson as the Master of the Rolls. While Bingham was on the Court of Appeal, he was appointed to conduct an inquiry into the Bank of England's supervision of the BCCI um, disaster, BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, had recently failed and had left thousands of depositors and shareholders exposed. Bingham concluded that the Bank of England's supervision was defective. After his report was published, an action was commenced by 6,231 depositors against the Bank of England. 
Relying on Bingham's report, Justice Clark and then the Court of Appeal struck out an action by the creditors against the Bank of England based on the tort of misfeasance uh, in public office, having no pro reasonable prospects of success. The House of Lords subsequently held that it was not appropriate for them to have had regard to Bingham's report, and they overturned the strikeout decision. Over the course of 12 years of litigation, the Bank of England, through its officers, was accused by the liquidators of what the trial judge described as an immense catalogue of outrageous behaviour, including a litany of claims of dishonesty. It was only after day 256 of the trial that the liquidators abandoned their claim. The judgment granting indemnity costs is one of the most scathing judgments ever written by an English judge. After Bingham's death, Lord Phillips lamented that maybe the House of Lords should have allowed the lower courts to follow Bingham's report, describing the litigation as the most expensive piece of hopeless litigation that the commercial court has ever seen. Bingham was appointed Lord Chief Justice in 1996 after Lord Taylor fell ill. Um, his appointment was unexpected, particularly because of his limited experience in criminal law. It was met with some opposition, including that of Lord Taylor, um, on the basis of his lack of experience, but misgivings were very soon dispelled. He sat regularly as Lord Chief Justice as a trial judge um, in order to regain the feel of trial and the sentencing procedure, and he would often travel out on circuit. In 2000, uh, Bingham then accepted Lord Irvine's offer of Senior Law Lord. After he was appointed Senior Law Lord, he had served four years as Lord Chief Justice and four years as Master of the Rolls. Traditionally, the role of Senior Law Lord went to the longest serving Law Lord to avoid the, the uh, issues that are created by leapfrogging. In 2000, that person was Lord Slynn, but Lord Slynn had been tainted with the scandal of the Pinochet affair. He had been the presiding judge in the first Pinochet case, and it was said that Lord Hoffman had spoken to him about Lord Hoffman's links with Amnesty International prior to the hearing, and they had both decided that disclosure to the parties was not necessary. The appointment to senior law lord was technically a step down from Lord Chief Justice for Lord Bingham, but it placed him in a position to influence the operations of the House of Lords at a time of great flux. He had also been finding the role of Chief Justice burdensome because of the administrative workload and the heavy emphasis on crime. He presided over the House of Lords at this time of high turnover. When he was appointed, the House of Lords comprised of Lords Slynn, Nichols, Stain, Hoffman, Hope, Clyde, Hutton, Saville, Hobhouse and Millet. By the time he retired in September 2008, the only three of the Lords who were on the court when he commenced were Lords Hoffman, Hope and Saville. Bingham was a firm believer in reform of the legal system. In 1989, when Lord Mackay proposed to allow solicitors <coughs> to appear before the High Court, Bingham publicly supported the move. He got on the wrong side of some of his colleagues by declaring that the greatest threat to the bar was not the proposal, but the profession's reaction to it. Bingham commented that, we delude ourselves if we do not suppose there is not a large body of responsible, middle of the road opinion that regards the legal profession as riddled with anachronistic conventions and privileges. Under Lord Bingham, the House of Lords began to change in very noticeable ways. Bryce Dixon, writing of the Bingham Court 2000 to 2008 in the Judicial House of Lords, saw this as a rare example of when a British court can be eponymised. Bingham supported the abolition of judicial wigs, the use of plain English, and the imposition of time limits on counsel. He convened seven, ben seven judge benches on six occasions, and within a couple of years of commencing, he'd even convened nine judge benches in exceptional cases, something that had never happened since 1910. He began the practice of collective judgments, which were, which were described as considered opinions of the committee. He introduced research assistants for the Lords. One of, his, one of the early research assistants told me that the Lords had very different approaches to their research assistants. Certainly none of them would permit their research assistants to draft judgments like the clerks did on the United States Supreme Court. But some of them would permit their research assistants to draft legal memoranda on cases before the judge. Others, I've been told, were nervous even about the propriety of allowing a research assistant to prepare a cup of coffee. Another hallmark of the Bingham Court was the eff efficiency by which the House of Lords dealt with matters. Appeals were, not, were now heard over only one or two days, with the average time for delivering judgment reduced to around two months. 
The reduction in delivery time for judgment was in very large part due to Bingham's contribution. After hearing an appeal, Bingham would often disappear to his cottage in Wales for the weekend and return with a draft judgment. As senior law lord, Bingham was a leader, but he did not embody many of the negative characteristics that are fortunately rarely seen in some, of, some courts. Bingham described his role as senior law lord as being like the conductor of an orchestra with a group of very experienced and talented instrumentalists. He had great respect for his colleagues and would never interrupt them during an appeal hearing. Nor would he ever attempt to dominate the hearing. He was not a tactician or a lobbyist like Atkin or Dillhorn. This meant that in some cases where the court was divided, he was in the minority and those cases amounted to almost 30%. In conferences after the appeal hearing, again, he did not attempt to dominate. Instead, he rigidly, rigidly adhered to the convention that as senior judge, he should speak last. Lady Hale has remarked that when judges made their comments after a hearing, junior to senior, they rarely knew what Lord Bingham was going to say. Stephen Sedley has described uh, the occurrence as follows. Both the Law Lords and the Privy Council just, uh, traditionally discussed their cases in reverse order of seniority. Bingham's natural courtesy inclined him anyway to listen to the others before expressing his own opinion. When he did so, and equally when conversing with colleagues, he would occasionally and unexpectedly decorate his prose with a four-letter expletive. Alan Patterson gives a wonderful example of Lord Bingham's respect for his colleagues. I should pause at this stage to say, on the, certainly on the federal court, I've never seen a departure from this same tradition of respect and independence in appeals. The example um, involves the House of Lords decision in Crown and Secretary of State for the Home Department, ex parte Anno Frieva. The question involved whether the withdrawal of income support needed to be communicated to an asylum seeker. The words of the legislation contain no such requirement. But during the hearing, it became clear that the House Home Office had a policy of withdrawing income support without ever notifying asylum seekers. Lord Scott, the junior judge, spoke first. His opinion was tentative, and he acknowledged that he had several changes of mind. He said that he would probably allow the appeal on the basis that notification was required. Lord Hoffman was next. He said originally he was going to allow the appeal, but he decided to dismiss it. The words of Parliament were clear. Lord Millet agreed with Lord Hoffman, but Lord Steyne would have allowed the appeal. So the bench was split 2-2. Lord Bingham spoke last. We must give effect to the clear words of Parliament, he said. The appeal must be dismissed. Lord Bingham wrote quickly, as was his practice. Then Lord Steyne circulated a blistering dissent. Lord Scott's doubts were removed and he joined with Lord Stain. Lord Millet and Lord Hoffman also changed their minds. So Lord Bingham went from being in the majority to being in a minority of one. As Patterson observes, true to form, he didn't fight for his position. But he did add a note to his judgment about the importance of giving effect to the clear words of statutes. Perhaps the most significant of Bingham's reforms on the House of Lords was his support for the establishment of a UK Supreme Court as a replacement to the Judicial House of Lords. Lady Hale described the Supreme Court as Lord Bingham's baby. Bingham was initially in one of a minority of the serving law lords who'd agitated for a Supreme Court, but his case for reform was simple. The outward reflection of the institution should be consistent with the practical reality. The law lords were no longer in any practical sense a committee of the upper house. They were a court and should be seen as a court. He was asked in an interview whether his peers in the House of Lords would also support the development of a Supreme Court, given that it would mean a loss of their peerages. Bingham responded, I don't speak for a united college, he said. The interviewer then observed that there might be a vestigial snobbery in some of his fellows um, who liked to be lords. Bingham replied, I don't give a... I'll edit his remarks at this stage, whether my peers do or do not. Bingham saw his proposition as being to, his position as being to steer the law lords towards being a Supreme Court that would occupy the same constitutional position as those in the United States and elsewhere. However, although he was an advocate for the development of a Supreme Court, he cautioned against the move to an American style court. He was opposed to the ability of a Supreme Court to challenge the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty by striking down acts of parliament. I'll come shortly to his strong views about parliamentary sovereignty and something of a contradiction in his philosophy of judging. 
In the previous lecture in this series, Justice Douglas rightly observed that most judges uh, engage in the business of judging without feeling the necessity to reflect in great length on the boundaries or philosophy of their role. Even fewer publish such reflections. Bingham was one of those few. Brian Simpson has speculated that this places Bingham in the ranks of a very small fraction of 1% of those who've held judicial power over the last millennium and engaged in very public reflection about their role. In England, that small fraction includes Fortescue, Cook, Mansfield, Eldon, Bacon, Hale, Blackstone, Atkin <coughs> and Denny. Notably, this includes almost all of the list of the, of the judges in this Selden series of lectures. Notable in Australia are Sir Owen Dixon, Dyson Hayden, Michael Kirby. In the United States, the judge who's written more about this subject than any other, in fact, probably more about any subject than any other judge, is Judge Posner. Some of Bingham's main reflections on judging um, were published in four of the lectures that he gave. The first was a lecture he gave in Oxford in 1990 entitled The Discretion of the Judge. The second was an, es an essay on the judge's lawmaker um, in a collection published in honour of Lord Cook in 1997. The third was his Maccabean lecture on jurisprudence in 2005. And the fourth was his Hamlin lectures in 2010. In the first of his essays in 1990, um, Bingham delivered it in Oxford, focusing on judicial discretion. He deliberately avoided the deep debate on that topic, from which Oxford was only just beginning to recover and perhaps still suffers. The opening paragraph of his speech began with an anecdote of what had caused Bingham great concern. A judge of my acquaintance once told me, he said, that when in the course of trying a case he encountered, whenever he encountered a problem of unusual difficulty, it was his practice to glower at counsel in the most forbidding manner and demand, is this not a matter within my discretion? On counsel agreeing that it was, which it seems they readily did, he would sink back into his chair with relief, relaxed in the knowledge that no matter what he decided, his decision would be immune from successful challenge on appeal. <laughs> the theme of Bingham's speech was to rail against undirected and unreviewable discretions. In 1997, building on this, uh, on this earlier essay, Bingham then posed four models of a judge. The first was those judges who say that it's their job to apply the law, but never to create it. The second is those judges who say that they do create law, but they should pretend that they do not. The third is those judges who say that they have a role to create law, but they should enthusiastically exercise this role in a relatively unconstrained way whenever the call of justice demands. And the fourth was the judges who say they have a role to create law, but that the important question is how they exercise this role and when they ought to exercise it. Unsurprisingly, Bingham located himself as a judge of the fourth variety. By the time of his 19, 2005 Maccabean lecture, Bingham turned to the manner in which judges should exercise that role. He articulated the importance of what he described as the elusive boundary between legitimate judicial development of the law on the one hand and impermissible judicial legislation on the other. The focus had built on Bingham's reflections 13, 15 years ago concerning judicial discretion. One of the most obvious constraints upon judicial discretion is to develop the law in the nature of inter partes adjudication. Ultimately, the judge's role is to resolve disputes or matters between parties. And within that adjudicative role, there are additional constraints that are built in with the idea of discretion. Bingham didn't express the matter in precisely these terms, but the tenor of his article was that the more constrained the discretion of the judge, the less of the role of the judge will resemble that of a legislator. But although Bingham railed against unrestrained direct discretion, he believed that a judge should have a significant margin for discretion. In a moment, I'll talk mainly of his enlargement of discretion in public law, but it's evident in his approach to private law as well, uh, particularly in relation to equity. In considering the divide between legislation and adjudication, Bingham also emphasised the importance of reasons and of the judge explaining honestly the considerations that actually motivated his or her reasons. It's not entirely clear um, what Lord Bingham meant by, his, by the conception of an honest explanation. For example, would his conception of transparent honesty be violated by the judge who reached a conclusion based on the general sense of a right decision, 
but then tried to develop a convincing legal justification for that decision, but without enunciating that the reasoning was proceeding from the top down or from the answer backwards. Perhaps Bingham avoided making any overt reference to this style because it was employed in different degrees by many of his colleagues. Indeed, as Justice Douglas showed us in the previous lecture, uh, Lord Denning's view was that this was the only legitimate approach to judicial decision making. At an even more fundamental level, this question also raised issues concerning a vast psychology literature, particularly in the United States, which is concerned with conscious, subconscious and sub-subconscious biases. But these were never really matters that concerned Lord Bingham. His view was probably consistent with Brian Simpson's assessment that when something, something is lost when we discount the judge's own view in favour of some attempt at pure objectivity. For instance, as Simpson observed in his essay on Lord Bingham, uh, when two lovers embrace in the moonlight, it will probably convey more to the bystander to use the description of the event as a kiss than to say that what they were really doing was engaging in a transmission of oral bacteria. The last of Lord Bingham's lectures, the Hamlin Lectures in 2010, were perhaps his most outspoken. Some background is necessary. Lord Bingham was one of the first supporters of the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights into English law. He regarded the uh, Human Rights Act 1998 as the Blair government's greatest achievement. He was the first senior judge since Lord Scarman to speak publicly on the incorporation of the European Convention into UK law. His responses, when challenged about the support, his support of the Act, were caustic. He would ask what right the, law, the UK could do without. Could the UK do without the right to life, the protection from torture, or for in, inhuman or degrading treatment? And each time he would challenge the interviewer to explain which right they would do without. In 2009, before Lord Bingham's Hamlin lectures, Lord Hoffman had brought his razor sharp bind to the issue in a piece that cut very deeply into Bingham's views. Lord Hoffman published an article in the world's leading law journal, the Law Quarterly Review, entitled The Universality of Human Rights. The title to the essay was slightly misleading. It should probably have had a question mark at the end of it. Hoffman's argument was that human rights were universal in abstraction, but national in application. His article raised concerns about the mechanism for the application of abstract principles to concrete facts in the United Kingdom. That mechanism was the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Lord Hoffman spoke of the practical problems. Um, by the 1st of November 2008, there were 100,000 individual petitions that were pending before the ECHR. 60% of them were from, five, were from five countries, Russia, Turkey, Romania, the Ukraine and Italy. Every one of those 100,000 petitions, if properly filled in, was required to go before a committee of three judges to determine admissibility and then before a committee of five, if admissible. This is obviously a massive backlog. Moving from the practical to the theory, Hoffman then gave a number of examples of decisions of the ECHR which were, in the language of Bentham, cases that he considered to be teaching grandmothers to suck eggs. I'll just describe one. This was the case of Saunders in the United Kingdom. In that case, the ECHR had held that Mr Saunders' right to a fair trial had been violated because the evidence against him had included transcript of what he'd said to inspectors investigating his conspiracy for um, false accounting and theft charges. This was because his statement to inspectors had been compelled by legislation and it was found to have infringed his privilege to remain silent. Lord Hoffman expressed some polite surprise at the failure of the ECHR to consider any part of the 200-year history of similar provisions in bankruptcy and company law before the ECHR pronounced on the infringement of the privilege to silence. He also remarked on the consequences of the decision. A subsequent case had involved the question of whether the right to fair trial had been denied by legislation which required the driver of a speeding vehicle to say who had driven it or, alternatively, to pay a fine. In the domestic courts, Lord Bingham had attempted to dispose of that case summarily, but in Europe it had proceeded all the way to the Grand Chamber before finally being dismissed and only by majority. One of the dissents said the following of the legislation against speeding. In my opinion, if there, were, if there are so many breaches of a prohibition, it clearly means something is wrong with the prohibition. 
It means that the prohibition does not reflect a pressing social need, given that so many people choose to breach it, even under threat of a criminal prosecution. If this is the case, maybe the time has come to review speed limits and set, and set limits that would correctly perfect, reflect people's needs. It's difficult for me to accept that hundreds of thousands of speeding motorists are wrong and only the government is right. Hoffman's critique continued. He focused on the hearsay rule and the life that was breathed into that rule by the Strasbourg Court after Parliament, the Law Commission and the English Courts had all tried to largely abolish it. He also considered the finding by the ECHR against the United Kingdom in relation to the question of whether judicial review was adequate concerning whether the United Kingdom had struck the right balance in relation to night flights from Heathrow. Lord Hoffman mused that a case involving night flights from Heathrow sounded about as far from human rights as you could get. I pause to say that Lord Hoffman also didn't mention the decisions of the ECHR, which nearly abolished the jury system, or the extreme controversy surrounding the decisions of the ECHR concerning prisoners' voting rights. So by the time of Lord Bingham's 2010 Hamlin lectures, he needed to respond, in his view, to these staunch criticisms. He did so in his usual polite and respectful way. He instanced a number of ECHR decisions, which he then went on to defend in great detail, a requirement for a legal framework to justify the interception of personal communications, the requirement for the state to destroy fingerprint and DNA samples of people who have been convicted of no crime, the invalidity of a blanket denial of artificial insemination procedures for serving prisoners, routine opening of prisoners' letters to solicitors. Some of these decisions were very controversial in the United Kingdom. But Lord Bingham finished with the decisions of the Strasbourg Court concerning intimate and sexual behaviour um, in relation to convention violations by laws which had criminalised homosexual behaviour and laws um, which had imposed a blanket policy um, where the Ministry of Defence had excluded homosexuals from the armed forces. Lord Bingham's concluding flourish relied upon the European decision in Smith and Grady. Perhaps somewhat ironically, in the Court of Appeal, Lord Bingham had himself um, upheld the policy of the UK Army of not allowing <coughs> gay um, men or lesbian women to serve. The European Court had subsequently found that policy was a breach of the Convention, and Lord Bingham um, lauded that decision. Lord Bingham accepted that his conception of the importance of the ECHR as a supranational body would have been regarded by Jeremy Bentham as nonsense on international stilts. But he argued that a purely national application of human rights, um, as Lord Hoffman had proposed, would inevitably lead to significantly different application between state and state. Bingham continued, lost would be the ideal, boldly proclaimed in 1948, imperfectly realised but noble in conception, that there are some rights so basic they should be enjoyed by everyone everywhere. Perhaps Bingham's best known judgments uh, were in this area of human rights. It was the 47-page <coughs> Leeds judgment uh, that he delivered in the Belmarsh prison case in 2004, for which he is perhaps most famous. Lord Bingham was in the majority in that case in holding that post-9-11 powers conferred by Parliament to detain foreign suspected terrorists without trial contravened the European Convention. One ground upon which Lord Bingham decided that case was the legislative provision that Section 23 of the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act 2001 had infringed the Convention right to security and liberty of the person. The Attorney General had argued that it was for Parliament and the Executive, not the courts, to assess what was necessary to protect the public and the extent to which it was necessary to derogate from the security of the person. Lord Bingham had a short answer. He said, the Attorney General is fully entitled to insist on the proper limits of judicial authority, but he is wrong to stigmatise judicial decision making as in some way undemocratic. It is particularly inappropriate in a case such as the present, in which Parliament has expressly legislated in section 6 of the 1998 Act to render unlawful any act of a public authority, including a court, incompatible with a convention right has required courts in section two to take account of relevant Strasbourg jurisprudence, has in section three required courts as so far as possible to give effect to convention rights. Lord Bingham's Belmarsh prison judgment did not explore the curiosity in section 6.1 of the Human Rights Act to which he referred. What does it mean to say that it is unlawful for an English court to act inconsistently with a convention right by applying UK legislation? 
In other words, what does the Human Rights Act mean in relation to courts when it provides that it is unlawful for the courts to act in a way which applies the law? A jurisprudence is now developing concerning dip disapplication of law. But this was not the concern in Belmarsh Prison. Following his judgment, Bingham was heralded by the Guardian as a, rad a radical who is leading a new English revolution. These words, intended as praise by the Guardian, were not received in that way by Lord Bingham. He responded that he did not think that the assessment was at all apt. He saw himself as applying the law, no more and no less. His position was perhaps weakened by his public and political advocacy for the law that he himself was applying. But perhaps this, this was why the press did not see his judgment the way he saw it. Um, Kettle, who was the author of the Guardian article, concluded his article by saying that Lord's, Lord Bingham's revolution may be poised for victory. We will all be winners if it succeeds. Bingham appro Bingham's approach continued in the second Belmarsh case, although in that case he was in the minority. He held that the onus was on the government to prove that evidence had not been obtained by torture and not on the party who was alleging it. Lord Bingham remarked, in words of unusual, although polite, force, I regret that the House should lend its authority to a test which will undermine the practical efficacy of the Torture Convention and deny detainees the standard of fairness to which they are entitled under Article 5, 4 or 6, 1 of the European Convention. Perhaps one tension within Lord Bingham's philosophy of judging was the coupling of his passionate defence of Strasbourg with his staunch defence of parliamentary sovereignty. Putting aside the European dimension, the United Kingdom's lack of a written constitution has historically seen debates about parliamentary sovereignty which rage usually over very extreme um, and unrealistic examples. To give a few of the examples cited by Bingham in his popular book, The Rule of Law, could Parliament legislate to require that all blue-eyed babies be killed? Could Parliament legislate to confiscate the property of all red-haired women or to deprive Jews of their nationality? These examples do not greatly assist the debate. Um, as Justice Dawson explained in this country, um, borrowing sub silento from um, Dicey, a legislature wishing to enact a statute that ordered that all blue-eyed babies be killed would hardly be perturbed by a principle of law which purported to deny it that power. But less exa extreme examples can make the principle seem more vibrant. So Edward Cook, in Dr Bonham's case, said that the Council of Physicians could not act as both the prosecutor of Dr Bonham as well as the judge. In one very famous passage, Cook wrote that, in many cases, the common law will control acts of parliament and sometimes adjudge them to be utterly void. For when an act of parliament is against common right or reason, or repugnant or impossible to be performed, the common law will control it and adjudge such an act to be void. There's one view which is now probably discredited that this passage was referring to a power to strike down legislation as void because it contravened principles of natural justice. More recently, in the challenge to the Hunting Act 2004 in um, Jackson and the Attorney General, Lord Steyne, Lord Hope and Baroness Hale all treated the rule of parliamentary sovereignty in the same way as a common law rule which might not apply in some circumstances. Lord Steyne suggested that judges had created this rule of common law and so they might, in particular circumstances, such as an attempt to abolish judicial review, modify the rule of public parliamentary sovereignty. Lord Bingham would have none of this. He cited one brilliant New Zealand writer who had characterised the arguments of, these, of three, uh, three of Bingham, Lord Bingham's former colleagues as unargued and unsound, historically false and jurisprudentially absurd. Lord Bingham himself would have had difficulty using these expressions, so he did them through uh, the medium of a commentator. His point, relying heavily upon the work um, also of <coughs> Professor Goldsworthy, was that the judges did not by themselves establish the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, and they cannot by themselves change it. He continued, what is at stake is the location of ultimate decision-making authority, the right to have the final word in a legal system. If the judges were to repudiate the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty by refusing to allow parliament to infringe unwritten rights, they would be claiming that ultimate authority for themselves. In settling disagreements about what fundamental rights people have, and where the legislation is consistent with them, the judges' word rather than the parliament's would be final. Since virtually all significant moral and political philosophies, contra controversies in contemporary Western societies involve disagreements about rights, 
This would amount to a massive transfer of political power from parliaments to judges. Bingham retired in 2008. Retirement did not slow him down. While many might have expected him to retire quietly to his cottage in Wales, he began a new life in the law. Perhaps this was unsurprising. He'd commented as early as 2003 that he would hate to be idle at any stage in his life. He returned to the University of Oxford without salary to lecture students and to lead seminars. And he began to write and speak publicly. I've already mentioned his Hamlin lectures, but he also wrote a popular book entitled The Rule of Law, which, to return to one of his earlier themes, is almost certainly in any list of the best hundred books entitled The Rule of Law. <laughs> he began also to deliver public addresses. He gave a very famous speech in 2008 denouncing the legality of the United Kingdom's involvement in Iraq. Perhaps the strongest criticism of Lord Bingham was that he was a little outspoken in public on policy issues such as the Human Rights Act. There are, however, some judges um, in today, not just in England, also in Australia, who believe that a judge in a leadership position should speak out on issues of policy. One difficulty with this view may be that it weakens the judge's claim as a neutral arbiter of technical issues. As one of uh, Lord Bingham's later colleagues remarked, it's important for the law to be as boring as possible. By this remark, I think what was meant to be emphasised was that the skill of great judges is technical legal competence rather than views on policy. The latter could compromise the law by allowing, uh, in the unfortunate modern parlance, a, a realist view to take hold. We can see this in jurisdictions where issues on technical application on, on, of questions such as um, the role of equity concerning the assignment of contractual rights will divide a court according to the political views of its judges. But two points should be emphasised which militate against any image of Bingham as being overtly political. The first is that in hindsight we can see from cases like Smith and Grady, which was the uh, gay and lesbian rights to serve in the armed forces, or Anna Frieva, that if Bingham was a political liberal, then he reached decisions by the proper application of the law as he saw it, even when that application must have been anathema to him. Secondly, apart from his extracurial advocacy for human rights legislation, Bingham was very guarded about any party, party political views that he held. He was sometimes described as a small L liberal, but when he was asked about this classification, he just smiled and said, well, I wouldn't really want to be called illiberal. When the Telegraph described him as being a Tory supporter, his son-in-law responded that he had no idea how Lord Bingham voted. As a modern judge, Lord Bingham's greatest virtue was to combine attributes that I think are rarely seen together. He was, brilliant, he was as brilliant as Diplock, <coughs> but unlike Diplock, he was genuinely modest, which enabled him to shift his position during oral argument. He was as sharp as Brandon or as Sumner, but unlike them, his words were steeped with the beauty of English civility, and he was never rude or sarcastic about his colleagues. He had the reforming zeal for the outdated of a Mansfield or a Denning, but he also had the caution and respect for precedent of a Wilberforce or a Reed. He wrote rapidly, perhaps more rapidly than any of his other contemporaries except for Lord Hoffman, who'd been known to circulate judgments even during a hearing. <laughs> but Lord Bingham never wrote to be tactical and he never wrote with an eye to garner a majority. As a peer of the realm and as a knight of the garter, he was far removed from the ordinary person. But he moved with everyday people comfortably and with humility, um, including sometimes with the language he used. And perhaps, um, although it might be said that spending weekends without running water or sanitation is not even the style to which ordinary people are accustomed. He had all titles, but no graces. When Bingham was persuaded in 2003 to stand for election as the Chancellor for Oxford University, Marcel Berlin's published a poem in The Guardian to describe his campaign. A law lord of great reputation, a judge known for brains and aplomb, is seeking an Oxford vacation. vocation. So now, he says, just call me Tom. Lord Bingham sounds posh and affected, so please follow his website.com. If you want him to Oxon elected, vote for plain, honest, simple, just Tom. Thank you.
Lord Bingham was a remarkable judge and legal writer. We've been privileged to have Justice Edelman capture just how remarkable he was. His career um, is in part testament to the continuing importance of judges at common law of great intellect who uphold human and individual rights. One of the books Lord Bingham published was entitled The Business of Judging, um, published in 2000, and it included an essay entitled Who Then in Law is My Neighbour? where his lordship analysed the English cases up to 1995 against Lord Atkin's famous question. Not surprisingly from what you've heard, he disagreed with the retreat in the then case law from the high water marks established by Anne's case and the concept of proximity. Those developments were called by our High Court uh, the Imperial March of the Tort of Negligence in one case. By the time he wrote this essay, Lord Bingham's views didn't accord with the House of Lords or our High Court. But I mention it because the lucid analysis and the measured argument of which you've heard Justice Edelman speak were typical of his writing. Even when supporting the column in retreat, he was able to make sense out of chaos. It's appropriate also, I think, as Justice Edelman mentioned, that he was instrumental in the abolition of the judicial capacity of the House of Lords. Uh, it's worth mentioning that he succeeded where Lord Selborne had failed in 1874. Perhaps in 100 years, Bingham won't be remembered. Uh, he was not the self-promoter, but perhaps his extrajudicial writings will see him remembered. I hope so. I suspect we all agree that Tom Bingham was an exemplary judge. We're all very grateful for Justice Settlement's uh, speech this evening. It is the sort of lecture that this lecture series has now, I think, stamped a high watermark for others to try and achieve later on. Would you join with me in thanking His Honour and uh, on your behalf I offer a small gift to our appreciation.